I'm paranormal romance author Miranda Thorne, and today I have a story so shocking that the Hungarian nobility covered it up for 200 years. You'd think bathing in blood would be the worst part of this story, but the truth is actually more gruesome than the myth. Elizabeth Bathory was born in 1560 into one of Central Europe's most illustrious families. She had uncles and cousins that were Transylvanian princes, and one uncle was the King of Poland. That's how illustrious we're talking. Her parents were progressive for the time period and believed that girls should be just as educated as boys. And this was a time where even most aristocrats couldn't read or write, so she was very well educated. A lot of the darker rumors about her family seem to be fake, but it is possible that mental illness ran in the family. Then again, a lot of the strange behavior attributed to them, such as temper tantrums or swordplay in the house, could also just be typical aristocratic eccentricities. We do know that as a child, Elizabeth was plagued by seizures that came with rage and uncontrollable behavior. She was prone to fits if she didn't get her way, but what kid isn't? Later in life, she also complained of blinding headaches. In 1572, when she was 12, she was sent to live with her fiancé's parents to learn to run his household and finish her social training. But her future mother-in-law died, and without her watchful eye, Elizabeth likely grew bored and unhappy. Her fiancé's court was different than hers, and Elizabeth was being groomed to be a lady of high station now, instead of just being a kid and getting to have fun. According to the gossip, she had an affair the summer she turned 13 with a young servant staying in one of the Nadas de Manors. She got pregnant and gave birth to a daughter that disappeared from written record and likely from Elizabeth's life. It was common practice to place illegitimate children with a different family, with enough money to pay for their care. After that, her family did everything to cover up the affair. Whether the rumors were true or not, and whether her future husband Ferenz knew or not, her wedding went on as planned and she was married at 14. He was 19, so at least we don't have a creepy age gap. Since her husband was away a lot, Elizabeth had control of the household and was heavy-handed with punishing the servants, especially the young girls. Her level of cruelty wasn't even acceptable in her own time period, when abusing servants was commonplace. Let's put it in perspective. These people were property. Mistreatment and even execution by their lords was fair game due to some very harsh laws enacted after a peasant uprising in 1514. It was really brutal stuff, and I won't get into it because that's not the point of this video, but check out the book on Elizabeth that I linked in the description for details. Or let me know if you want a video on that topic it would be a cheery one. Elizabeth and her husband seemed well-matched in their sadistic streak. He even taught his wife a few torture techniques, including a summer variation on her winter executions, where the victims were tied out naked, slathered in honey for insects to bite. I guess that's one way to keep the romance alive in your arranged marriage. So nothing seemed unusual at first. A servant girl died in the night at Castle Savar. When the pastor arrived, the casket was already closed and sealed. Elizabeth claimed it was for safety, due to the woman having cholera. But this wasn't unusual. The poor hygiene at the time caused a lot of death. But then, bodies seemed to follow Elizabeth wherever she visited. Rumors of torture and her strange behavior began to spread. Anna Darvalia was her first accomplice. Locals describe her as a wild beast in female form. She allegedly taught Elizabeth and other servants elaborate methods of torture and instructed Elizabeth to take only peasant girls because they wouldn't merit the attention of authorities. She was supposedly running a torture chamber within Savar Palace, with Ferenz and Elizabeth's approval and participation. Ferenz taught Anna to strangle servants in a Turkish style of execution, something he picked up in battle against the Turkish armies. By March of 1602, the clergy at Savar were debating whether to deny Anna the Eucharist and possibly excommunicate her. But this was risky. Anna was under the Lord and Lady's protection. They also considered excommunicating Ferenz and Elizabeth, but Ferenz managed to appease the ministry, likely with charm and large donations. While Ferenz enjoyed torturing his female servants, he drew the line at actually killing them. He actually forbade killing them. His wife seemed to obey him the best she could. But as you'll come to find out, she doesn't have the best self-control ever. But it was only after her husband died that the number of deaths escalated dramatically. So you might be wondering why they were never caught legally. I mean, the clergy is calling them out in front of the whole congregation. You'd think something would be done. But by this point, Ferenz was a war hero who kept the continent safe from invading Turkish hordes. He was the Black Knight of Hungary. The Hungarian king also owed him enormous sums of money, so much that even he couldn't repay it. As long as the royal court was so indebted to Ferenz, they couldn't touch him or his wife. 
But Ferenz dies in 1604 and Elizabeth's mental state deteriorates quickly. Even though they were nobles, they actually had money problems. Lots of land, no cash. Now Ferenz always got by with his military salary and mostly through stealing from Turkish armies he conquered. Without all that loot coming in, Elizabeth's tax bills were becoming overwhelming. She also no longer had the protection of her husband's position and things were about to get worse. In 1604, an uprising began against the Hungarian king and the Holy Roman Emperor. Troops were routinely sent to fortify Hungarian castles, but when the king didn't pay them, they would turn to looting towns and castles, sometimes causing even more damage than the previous Turkish invasions. This included some of Elizabeth's lands. Stressful, right? Then, during this uprising, her brother died. On the way back to the family estate, she snapped and attacked the handmaids riding with her. Three of them died of their injuries after the trip. One that survived later died at one of her estates. When their parents asked what happened to them, they were told they all died of cholera. We're starting to see a pattern here. During a different trip, one of her maids found it so unbearable to attend Elizabeth that the girl tried to escape into the countryside in the middle of winter. On another trip, she tortured another girl to death and she was buried midway through the trip. Elizabeth's other servants chased her down and the girl was taken to a nearby village stripped naked in the frigid December air, forced to walk into a river up to her neck and doused repeatedly with water. She later died of exposure. Freed from her husband and pushed beyond sanity by the stress of war, her death toll rose quickly. According to her servants, within a few years of her husband's death, her victims had risen to 200. In this time of upheaval, it's not surprising that the royal court didn't turn their attention to Elizabeth. They're fighting rebels and the Turks. Also, she appeared to be a generous lady in public who helped the people she ruled. But at the same time, the monks who lived across the street from her Viennese manor were said to be so deeply disturbed by the screams coming from it that they hurled pots at the windows to drown out the noise. When the Countess took up permanent residence at Cheyde, she began a reign of terror in the small nearby villages and rumors of witchcraft started as well. Less than three years before her trial, she was still making public appearances, including the coronation of Matthias as the King of Hungary and Croatia. And of course, she can't go on a trip without murdering people. It seems like the more stressful the social engagement, the more she took it out on her servant girls. Once, when a girl was accused of stealing, Elizabeth had a coin heated until red hot and pressed into the girl's hand. She would stick needles into the girl's lips or under their fingernails, and if they cried out in pain, she would say they could remove them, only to beat them and cut off their fingers in a rage. And it gets worse. You might want to plug your ears. Other forms of torture included chunks of skin being wrenched away with pliers, flesh cut from the shoulders and buttocks, hands being crushed, red hot pokers being shoved into places, I hope I don't need to be more clear than that, and beating so severe that flesh fell from the bones. How should I signal the people who covered their ears? You're right, it's probably better that they stay that way. Parents actually began hiding their daughters when the Countess passed through town. Offers of work, promises of marriage, and even large payouts to families stopped attracting her victims. They had to engage a network of people, nobles, and commoners to acquire girls. In the winter of 1609, she opened an academy for etiquette to the higher-born girls of the aristocracy who hadn't heard of the rumors of torture and murder yet. It was a way to bring in victims and much needed money. But now she was getting sloppy. At one point, girls from the academy were buried in too shallow a grave, and dogs dug them up and carried their body parts around the yard. Maids now appeared in public with bruises and bandages and burn scars. More and more people seemed to witness the torture. One girl even escaped and made it all the way to town with a knife still buried in her foot. Elizabeth burned through the entire academy of girls in a matter of weeks, and instead of saying cholera killed them, she claimed one of the girls had murdered all the others. Since the clergy had started refusing proper burials to her victims, her accomplices started burying them, well, everywhere. Gardens, drainage ditches, grain bins. This led to more rumors of black magic. She also met frequently with a forest witch. All the rumors of witchcraft may have contributed to her downfall since she was scandalizing the clergy. Murdering an entire academy of noble girls was a step too far. In 1610, complaints began to reach the king himself, and the clergy began to keep detailed records of every burial requested by the countess. Without her husband to charm and bribe them, they began to speak out, and legal action started taking place against the countess in February of 1610. When a new reverend took over for Pastor Barosius, he was aware of Barosius' numerous arguments with the countess and the records he was keeping of all the bodies buried in secret, sometimes nine in one night. 
the Reverend decided to investigate for himself. He went down to explore the tunnels under the castle when he was met with an awful stench where he discovered the remains of several girls. He rushed back to the church and tried to get a letter out, but it was intercepted by Elizabeth's staff. Of course, when he learned this, he panicked. I mean, she's murdered a lot of people and he tried to get out of town, but he was captured and returned to the church with a stern warning to essentially stop sticking in his nose where it didn't belong. So he plotted how to get his letters out and eventually was successful. By now, Elizabeth knew the walls were closing in on her and she prepared to divide her properties between her three children. But Palatine Thurzo was a longtime family friend. He'd actually promised her husband that he would take care of her and he wanted to be sure she'd done these horrible things before he condemned her. So when he went to see her, she was charming and intelligent and so seemingly normal that he went away without arresting her. Literally, as soon as the doors closed behind him, she flew into a rage. Her staff was so careless with discarding the bodies that many people in the town saw and the rumors brought the Palatine back along with the king. She tried to work a spell with the forest witch to make sure they discovered nothing and left her in peace. She may have even tried to poison them during their visit because they were all ill after a dinner party she threw. She was arrested on December 29th, 1610, but this might have had less to do with her rising body count and more to do with the king hoping to steal Elizabeth's land so he could avoid paying off the money he owed her. Anything to catch a killer, but you do have to wonder how long this would have went on if the king didn't owe her money. So no one knows exactly how many people she killed. She wasn't allowed to testify her at her own trial, so she was never interrogated, um, which would have meant torture then. Those always went together. They only found enough remains to charge her with 80 deaths. Only one girl testified to the number being 650. According to her, one of Elizabeth's stewards had a ledger written by the Countess listing them all, but when he testified later, he never mentioned it, and it seemed very unlikely even the King and Palatine Thurzo didn't believe this girl. Other testimony is more consistent and falls in the 100 to 200 range. The same day the trial ended, two of her accomplices had their fingers torn off before being executed. The one man, because he was so young and had committed far less crimes, was just beheaded. Later, the forest witch who'd helped her with spells and possibly poisonings was condemned as a witch and burned at the stake. The final accomplice, who was said to be kinder than the others and mostly cleaned up after the killings, was spared immediate execution. No one knows if they found more evidence to condemn her or if she eventually died or was released from prison. Elizabeth barely escaped a torture and execution of her own. There was a war between Catholics and Protestants brewing again. The king owed her money and he would have been next in line to be emperor with the Catholic Church's backing. He could wipe out his debt and take land from a Protestant in the same blow. However, Elizabeth had already made her will when she felt the legal noose tightening, which turned out to be a very good call. Her children would get all her lands and the king would gain nothing, so there was no reason to execute her. But the king was desperate and reopened the case anyway, seeking out new witnesses, but all he got were more headaches. This is when details came out about her husband being involved in torture and what seems like nearly half the countryside helping to procure girls for her. It seemed like no one was innocent here. And he couldn't let the details of a beloved war war hero torturing girls come to light. So Palatine Thurzo was able to convince him not to execute her. The deal was that she would be erased from history, court documents sealed, and her name would never be spoken by polite society again. She was bricked into the tower of her castle with just a slot to pass in food and supplies. She died three years later after complaining that her hands were very cold. But 200 years later, she would rise again. Too much? What's too much? So the story goes that the aging countess was having her hair combed by a young servant girl. The girl accidentally pulled her hair and Elizabeth slapped her so brutally that she drew blood. Some of it splashed onto Elizabeth's face and when she washed it away, the skin seemed to take on the girl's youthful appearance. This appears to be fiction. While she drew a lot of blood, she always ordered it cleaned up, not collected. The vampire rumors might have started because when she couldn't get out of bed to beat them, she would bite the girls on their faces and necks. There's no actual testimony to her bathing in blood. This was added by a historian about 200 years after her death during the height of some vampire hysteria in the region. When this priest discovered her sealed trial documents, he collected some stories from the villagers around Cheithe, and her legend had grown to include bathing in the blood of young virgins. The king might be able to hide her deeds in the royal court, but he couldn't erase her legend from the minds of the people she'd hurt the most. So now that you've reached the end, do you feel her story needed the embellishment with the bathing in blood rumor? I think she earns her spot in hell without it. 
let me know what you think in the comments. If you'd like to stay up to date on when my next book or video comes out, sign up for my newsletter. It's the best way to keep in contact with me.